Character development is said to be the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. During the next hour, we will explore both our privilege and our responsibility to become Christ-like in character. Join us now for this powerful time of personal renewal as Pastor Stephen Wallace takes us from glory to glory. Good morning, good morning, and happy Sabbath. What happened to that delightful weather we had there for a spell? Thank you for braving the elements and coming out this morning. What a privilege it is to gather in God's house on God's day to study God's word. Amen? But my dear friends, we have gathered in vain unless the Holy Spirit joins us. And he is prepared to do that upon our invitation. Yes, he's here, for he has promised, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. But my friends, please don't be satisfied to just have him in our midst as a congregation. Make sure that he is in your midst as an individual. There's a difference. Do I hear an amen? amen. There is a big difference. You see, inspiration tells us that the latter rain can be falling all around us and we won't even know it. Why? Because though the Holy Spirit is present, it can only fill those whose hearts are open. Amen? Yes. Therefore. Do you hear the knock this morning? Before we open the Bible, we must open our hearts. Remember that memory device and personally invite God's Spirit to come in. Spiritual things are only spiritually discerned. And you've heard me say that before. Please, don't resent me for reminding us, myself included, over and over again, we are oh so prone to be self-sufficient when it comes to the study of the Word of God. God forgive us. We are desperately dependent, my dear friends, upon the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are going to have a life-changing experience in the study of God's Word. Sure, we can have an intellectual exercise without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can, uh, you know, fill time without the power of the Holy Spirit. But God forbid that we just fill time with an intellectual exercise. Amen? God grant that we have a life-changing experience today. And that can and will be ours if we personally invite God's Spirit into our hearts. And as you pray for yourself, I solicit your prayers. I need the Holy Spirit in a special way today. Would you pray for me too? Let's kneel, as is our practice, for a few moments of silent prayer. My Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the privilege of gathering together on this your day in this your place. And I thank you that you are here, for you have promised. But Father, we want to personally invite you to come into our hearts. And so each one of us chooses to open the door of our heart and say, come in. Come in, heavenly guest, in the person of your spirit, Father, indwell us. Quicken and energize our mental and spiritual faculties. Especially do that in my behalf. I am not worthy of the privilege of leading out in the study of your word, nor am I adequate to the task. But by virtue of Christ's worthiness and by virtue of the all-sufficiency, the adequacy of his grace, please condescend to use me, empower me, enable me to speak truth and only truth, the truth as it is in Jesus. Guide my thoughts, my words, Please touch my lips with a coal. Purge me. And don't let me even flavor, let alone defile, the truth that you want to pour through me. Please, Father. And should anyone receive a blessing, we will all know who alone gets the honor and the glory and the gratitude and the praise. It is you 
and not for one moment the poor earthen vessel you condescended to use. O oh Lord, bless your church that she might arise and shine with the reflected character of the bridegroom. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in a several part study on mental <coughs> dietary. What is mental dietary? It's what we feed the mind. How do we feed the mind? Through our senses, especially our eyes and our ears. You see, the mind is a wonderful, marvelous, highly sophisticated, and incredibly powerful computer. And that which directly determines how it functions is how it is programmed. What we feed the mind programs our thoughts and our feelings, and our thoughts and feelings combined make up our what? Our moral character. That is precisely why in beholding we are changed. Changed into the likeness of what we behold. Because what we behold influences our thoughts, and our thoughts determine what we are. You see the direct cause-effect relationship there, don't you? This makes it absolutely imperative, my dear friends, that we select very carefully what we feed the mind. Do I hear an amen? amen. Are there different kinds of mental dietary available in the world today? Yes, there certainly are. That which is readily and naturally available, however, is that which is calculated and prepared by the master chef of sinfulness, Satan himself. It's masterfully prepared to satisfy and gratify the perverted lusts of the flesh. And there's a whole lot of that food out there. And we all have a natural tendency to crave it anyway. Will you admit that? And so it being readily available and our having a natural hungering and thirsting for it, it is only inevitable that we will gorge ourselves on that except by divine help and grace. Now, to start off with, we have no natural appetite for anything but that which is carnal. So we've got to begin by getting a new heart. And that new heart has new desires, new appetites. And that we receive as a gift of grace at the foot of the cross upon request. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. At that point, we receive the capacity. We receive the what? The capacity to hunger and thirst after the Word of God. But my dear friends, we must develop and strengthen that new spiritual appetite by cooperating with the Holy Spirit and feeding ourselves spiritual food. Amen. We must taste and see that the Lord is good. And the more we taste, the more we will see that the Lord is indeed good. And we will develop and strengthen the spiritual appetites. And we will cultivate the spiritual palate so that it enjoys the flavor of the bread of life. But the challenge, of course, is that we have this old palate that has become addicted to that highly seasoned carnal junk food. Are you following this? And it is no small task to resist the temptation to throw the old man an occasional McDonald's every once in a while. Forgive me for dipping into the physical realm, but I'm trying to make the spiritual more understandable. There are all sorts of mental hamburgers out there. And since the old man naturally craves it, and since it's so readily available, there's all sorts of fast food places where you can stop in for a minimum of time and money and throw your mind some carnal junk food. And you can sit down in your own living room and throw your mind some carnal junk food if you've got a TV there. 
And we, we, we dealt with that last night, and I'm going to try to resist getting back into that today. Bless your hearts. You know, and I, I feel so strongly about that because of my own, my own pilgrimage. Oh, my brother, my sister. You see, what I did for the longest time is I thought uh, I could be selective and I could exercise discretion regarding what I would watch. The games we play with ourselves. Do you hear what I'm talking about? You see, there, there is junk food and then there is junk food. And I thought that I would only eat junk food and get away with it. I'm here to tell you, if you really want to grow consistently, you got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Amen. Not even slightly junk food should you feed your mind. Do I hear an amen? Come on now. We got to start getting serious if we're going to get ready for Jesus to come. We got to starve the old man and feed the spiritual man. And every time, I know this from personal experience, every time you indulge in a little relatively benign junk food, what do you do? You immediately strengthen those carnal appetites. And he craves all the more, okay? And then you run out real quick of relatively benign junk food, and then because you've strengthened your appetite, you've got to start indulging in a little less benign junk food. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. This, this whole game that I played with myself, where I was going to be selective regarding what I watched. And by the way, we don't have a TV, but we do have a DVD player at our research center. You've got to have that. There's a lot of wonderful material on DVD that is available for spiritual edification. So we have a DVD player. But when I got it, I remember actually shaking as I brought it home because I was so afraid of the potential that I had of using it to feed my carnal man. And for the longest time, I played this game with myself where I would select only, you know, relatively good stuff. I wouldn't think of looking at the garbage, but the, the relatively good stuff. And every time I would do that, I would strengthen my carnal appetite and I would revive my addiction. And then pretty soon you run out of relatively good stuff, and so what have you got to do? You got to lower the standard a little bit and start watching a little more. And my dear friends, in exposing ourselves to anything that is carnal, please follow this, we inevitably will desensitize ourselves to the offensiveness of carnality. And bless your hearts, some of you who were here last night, you probably thought, man, this guy has really got a problem with television and videos and movies. What's so bad about that stuff anyway? I'm here to tell you, dear friend, if anything like that went through your mind, that is a bright red flag, and that should alert you that you are in advanced stages of desensitization. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? If you don't recognize the grossness and the offensiveness of the carnal garbage that is pumped into human minds through these screens, television, videos, and movies, then you are in advanced stages of desensitization. Please. Wake up and determine by God's grace to set nothing wicked before your eyes. And then, as you get resensitized to the offensiveness of wickedness, you will find that it is really very, very offensive. Even the, even the, you know, the comedies, they're so foolish. There is so much foolishness. And my dear friends, we are to be sober. Now that doesn't mean morose and, 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 you know, grim and unhappy, but that means very earnest and serious and fully aware of where we stand in Earth's history and how imperative is it, it is for us to get ready and help others get ready in these closing moments of Earth's history. 
Besides, we've got an enemy who is constantly trying to destroy us. We need to be sober-minded in this lightweight foolishness that is the relatively benign stuff that comes across these screens. If we feed our minds that, we will make ourselves lightweight and foolish. You are what you eat. Do I hear an amen? Come on, admit it with me. You are what you eat. Please. You know, yeah, and I'm getting involved in television again. I wasn't going to do that, but what, what really amazes me, my dear friends, is that there is regularly shown on primetime television today in this nation stuff that would never have been allowed at any time, just not all that long ago. In fact, you read, you read the official guidelines to govern television programming that was put out by the government 20 years ago, and you have to just shake your head and laugh. They wouldn't allow anything, for example, that even approached profanity. Not anything that even what? Approached profanity. Now what do you hear? Almost all the time, incessantly, on even family television, profanity. What happened? How did the enemy pull that off? Very, very subtly and gradually and incrementally by exposing us to it and thereby desensitizing us to its offensiveness. And profanity is just one illustration. Immorality. Incredible, explicit, gross immorality portrayed in living color never would have made it at any time on television, just not that long ago. And the whole nation not only doesn't rise up and cry out, but it sits back and enjoys it and demands more. You know I'm telling you the truth. And my dear friends, if we sit down and expose ourselves to this kind of garbage, we are not only desensitizing ourselves to its offensiveness, we are cultivating a perverted appetite for it. Don't play games with yourself on this one. Please don't. I did for a long time. And it was a, a constant hindrance and limitation to my spiritual growth. I had to really get serious and decide that I was through with even the relatively benign junk food. And I was going to feed my mind only the very best mental dietary. Only then have I been able to really experience consistent victory in my personal Christian experience. And growth. Oh, friends, please, this mental dietary issue is so important. But what I want to turn our attention to today is particularly the importance of feeding yourself that which is wholesome. What we've been looking at is, is the importance of not feeding ourselves that which is unwholesome. Now let's get positive. Let's look at the necessity of feeding ourselves that which is wholesome. The title of our study, Looking Unto Jesus. We are Lesson 32 page 69. Lesson 32, uh, lesson, yes, 32, page 69. Now, the Christian experience is summed up in the words of Paul in Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. What conforms us to this world? It's by programming our mind with the things of this world. Are you following me? If we are going to be transformed, we've got to stop programming, stop programming the mind with the things of this world and start programming them with the things of God. Do I hear an amen? You see, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So to be a Christian, we have got to change the way we think. We have got to come to have the mind of Christ. Amen? We're back to basics here, but we've got, to, we've got to remind ourselves of these things. 
let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. That is the essence of the Christian experience. Now, if we're going to do that, we have to program the mind with the things of Christ. That's why our key text comes into play here again. What is it for the whole seminar? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. How is the mind transformed? How are we transformed by the renewing of our minds? By beholding the glory of Christ. And what's the glory of Christ? It's His character. And we are changed into the likeness of what we behold. Changed into the likeness of what we behold. Now, we must come, my dear friends, to have a pure heart, a Christ-like mind. We are going to be either effective witnesses for the king or fit citizens for the kingdom. And that requires diligent effort on our part. It requires what? Diligent. diligent effort on our part. But the effort is not to change ourselves. The effort is to keep our mind's eye fixed on Jesus. I said something very important there. The effort is not to change ourselves. The effort is to keep our mind's eye fixed on Jesus. That by His Holy Spirit, He might change us from glory to glory. That is so crucial. Listen, Ministry of Healing, page 491. We need a constant sense of the ennobling power of pure thoughts. The only security for any soul is in right thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The power of self-restraint strengthens by exercise. Take courage. The power of self-restraint, what? Strengthens by exercise. That which at first seems difficult, by constant repetition, repetition grows what? Easy. Easy. Praise God. Until right thoughts and actions become habitual. You can make good habits as well as bad habits. Amen? Amen. But changing habit patterns requires persevering, diligent effort, doesn't it? Especially when it comes to mental dietary. Back to our statement. If we will, if we what? Will, and that involves the power of choice. If we will, we may turn away from all that is cheap and inferior and rise to a high standard. We may be respected by men and beloved of God. But please notice, what is absolutely necessary if we are going to rise to a higher standard and grow from glory to glory? It is turning away from all that is cheap and inferior. That's why we read last night in Psalm 119, verse 37, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Do we need revival as a people? We all need revival as a people. But what is an absolutely essential requisite to revival? It's turning our eyes away from worthless things. Amen? Amen? And getting them fixed on who? On Jesus. Getting them fixed on Jesus. But self and Satan will constantly oppose us, my dear friends, as we seek to take our eyes, particularly our mind's eye, off the things of the world and get our mind's eye fixed on Jesus. And by the way, please notice, I'm talking about two things here. I'm talking about the physical eyes and the mind's eye. There is a difference. Now, they are intimately associated, inseparably associated, but there is a difference. The physical eyes are what, of course, we use to look at various things with and see images. But please know that what the physical eyes look at has a direct and dramatic ex uh, effect upon what the mind's eye is looking at, doesn't it? There is a direct correlation there. Now, granted, you can be looking at something with your physical eyes and your mind's eye can be someplace else. You know that. And I, I, that's that uh, TV stare that I get every once in a while. 
<laughs> I can tell that though you're looking at me, your mind is someplace else. But don't let me get sidetracked with TV again. <laughs> the, the physical eyes have a direct and dramatic effect upon what the mind's eye beholds. That's why in beholding, we are what? Changed. Because what our physical eyes look at program the mind's eye, influence the focus of the mind's eye, which determines what we are. Now, keeping the mind's eye on Christ is no small challenge, but we must, by God's grace, learn to do it. Do I hear an amen? amen. Listen to this statement. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 595. If Satan seeks to divert the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back again and place it on eternal things. And listen, and when the Lord sees the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts, he will attract the mind like the magnet. Oh, I love that. He will attract the mind like the what? like the magnet, purifying the thoughts and enabling them to cleanse themselves from every secret sin. Amen. Praise God for that. But my dear friends, when will he attract the mind like the magnet? When? Please. Did you notice? When the Lord sees the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts. You see, again, we're back to the fact that God cannot unleash supernatural power on anyone who doesn't really want it. And our choice to receive that power must be ratified by an effort to carry out that choice. Remember that study? And the, the miracles that Christ performed, for those of you who've been with us? So key here. So key. So when the Lord sees determined effort, he will what? He will attract the mind like the magnet, purifying the thoughts and enabling them to cleanse themselves from every secret sin. And then we have one of the key texts, casting, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, how many thoughts? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Wow. Every thought, my dear friends. You see, that's our goal, is to have the mind's eye constantly and continually and exclusively on Jesus. Every thought brought into captivity to who? To Jesus. Yes. Now, how is this done? Finally, brethren, Philippians 4, 8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate. Or in the King James, think on these things. Yeah. My dear friends, there is your mental menu. Yeah. Dear Christian, if you want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, you must feed your mind only that which is on that menu that we just read. Do I hear an amen? You have got to start being very conscientious and selective regarding what you feed your mind. The choice is yours. But please know that no man can serve what? Two masters. They have absolutely opposite appetites, the flesh and the spiritual nature. They are contrary one to another. That's why Jesus says no man can serve two masters. Because you see, there is no food, there is no mental dietary that will satisfy them both at the same time. Are you understanding this? Their appetites are so totally opposite that you can only feed one or the other. You can never feed both at the same time. Therefore, what must you do? Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Which one are you going to feed? Now, what, what most of us try to do, hear me now, be honest with me, though it's impossible to feed both at the same time, what we try to do is feed one for a while and then the other for a while. Come on now, will you admit that? 
And we start out in the morning for our allotted feeding time for the spiritual nature. And we feed him something. And then in the evening, because our favorite television program is on, we sit down and feed the carnal nature. And that is precisely why we are Laodicean. Did you hear what I told you? That is precisely why we are lukewarm. We haven't got serious about becoming Christ-like. And we haven't made, on the basis of that serious commitment, consistent, appropriate decisions regarding mental dietary. We haven't decided to starve the old man and feed only the spiritual nature. And my dear friends, we will remain Laodicean until we make that decision. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Please know that. Don't play games with yourself on this. You have got to get serious. You have got to get radical if you're going to be changed from glory to glory and be ready for Jesus to come and be useful to him in helping anyone else get ready in the meantime. The choice is yours. But I have got to make it very plain to you what's involved. Please don't fool yourselves on, yourselves on this. Please don't. Where do we find all such things that are on this menu? That which is true, that which is noble, that which is just, that which is pure, that which is lovely, that which is of good report, that which is virtuous, that which is praiseworthy. Where do we find all such things in their ultimately beautiful revelation? Where do we find it? In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Therefore, the Christian's motto is that what, which Paul states so succinctly in Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Do I hear an amen? My dear friends, that must not only be our motto, though, we must recognize that as our mandate looking unto Jesus. And I'm not even satisfied to leave it there. That which is our motto and our mandate must become our magnificent obsession, looking unto Jesus. That's it. And it is not until that becomes our magnificent obsession that we will be able through consistent cooperation with the Holy Spirit by fixing our eyes on Jesus to be changed from glory to glory and thereby become the people that God wants us to be. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, work with me on this word looking looking. It's weak in the English. It's a weak translation of the Greek. The Greek is a very unique word. The Greek word is aphorao. Aphorao. And it is made up of two words. A prefix, apo, which means from. And the verb horao, which means to stare at to gaze constantly upon. Are you following this? You put those together and you have our word that's translated looking, aphorao. Please understand what Paul is telling us, though, by using this unique verb. He's telling us that, first of all, we've got to turn away from looking at everything else. That's what the apo part is about. You've got to turn your eyes away from all that so readily distracts you. And you've got to rivet your mind's eye, focus your mind's eye, stare with constant steady gaze upon Jesus Christ. That's the essence of this verb. That's literally what's, what it's saying. And by the way, the, uh, 
the, the uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance defines the verb this way, to turn the eyes from other things and fix them on something. Right out of the Strong's. That's what aforao means. Apo and horao together, you say it aforao. What does it mean? To turn the eyes from other things and fix them on something. And what's the something in this case? It's Jesus. My dear friends, that in a nutshell is our essential cooperative role. But that takes diligence. That takes persevering effort combined with divine power. That takes the exercise of the will and a spiritual mental discipline that most of us are totally unacquainted with. God help us get acquainted with that. Amen. Spiritual mental discipline of turning our mind's eye from everything else and fixing it exclusively on Jesus. You see, this is absolutely imperative. If we are going to be able to grow and to maintain victory. Listen. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 744. Our daily and hourly work is set forth in the words of the Apostle, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Do we have a work to do in our Christian experience? Do we? Yes. What is it? Is it to change ourselves? No. You can't do that. A leopard can't change his spots or an Ethiopian the color of his skin. You can't do that. You must be changed. But does that mean you don't have a work to do? No, please don't conclude that you have nothing to do just because you can't change yourself. Only the Holy Spirit can change you. But the Holy Spirit can't even change you unless you cooperate. Do I hear an amen? amen? And how do you cooperate? By looking unto Jesus. So that He can change you into the likeness of what you behold. Amen? amen? There's no way that we can be changed from glory to glory unless we are cooperating by beholding the glory of the Lord. And right there is the reason why we are so... Laodicean again. We haven't gotten serious about taking our eyes off the things of the world and getting them fixed exclusively on Jesus. And that's why we're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. We have a form of godliness. We go through the routine and we behave pretty well, especially compared to others. But it's just whitewash, dear friends. Come on now, admit it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to judge anyone in this, in this room. I'm simply exploring with you the verdict of the true witness. This is his evaluation of the end time church. We can't deny his verdict. And the reason for it is because we have our mind's eye all together too frequently on the things of this world still. And we spend very little time fixing our mind's eye on Jesus. And of course, in beholding, we are changed into the likeness of what we behold. Gotta tell it to you straight, my friends. Please don't resent me for talking so straight to you. And you notice I'm using the personal pronoun. I'm talking about us, we. We need revival as a people. Amen? Amen. So what have we got to do? We got to turn our eyes away from worthless things and get them fixed on Jesus. We got to aforao. We've got to aforao. That's our daily hourly work. Our daily hourly work. What verb tense do you suppose looking is in the Greek? Come on, those of you who've been with me. Our pre that's the present active tense. And what's the present active tense mean? Ongoing, continuous action, whatever that is. Looking. This is in the present active tense in the Greek. It means we must be continually looking unto Jesus. Not just occasionally. What? Continually. Do I hear an amen? Amen. This is a radical spiritual discipline we're talking about. And most of us are totally unfamiliar with it. But it's what it's going to take if we're going to really gain 
Two things, follow this, two things. Consistent victory over temptation and continual growth into Christ-likeness of character. We must aforao, turn our eyes away from everything else and get them fixed on Jesus, particularly the mind's eye, if we are going to gain consistent victory over temptation and experience consistent, uh, continual growth into Christ-likeness of character. Now let's work with both of those. In our remaining time here, let's look at the necessity of doing this in order to gain consistent victory over temptation. Okay? Testimonies, Volume 4, page 357. Our chief danger is... Now, by the way, any sentence that starts out like that ought to cause you to sit up and really take note. What is our chief danger, dear friends? Our chief danger is in having the mind diverted from Christ. That's our what? Our chief danger. It's in having the mind's eye diverted from Christ. Now, if you were here this morning, who do you suppose would stand up in his big, booming fisherman voice and say, Amen, preach it, brother? Who? Peter. Peter, the apostle. Didn't he have a very tangible experience regarding the chief danger Amen. of having the mind's eye diverted from Christ? It's recorded in Scripture. And I used to wonder a long time why in the world it was recorded. I mean, it was kind of an exciting story. Walking on water, wow. But I didn't understand the spiritual object lesson for a long time, but I do now. Do you? And by the way, why was Jesus himself walking on water? Was he just showing off? Hey, hey, look what I can do. I'm God. I can walk on water. Is that what he was doing? No. Why was he walking on water? Because that's the only way he could possibly have gotten across? No. I mean, there, there were lots of other ways he could have gotten across. So why was he walking on water? My dear friends, please understand that to the Hebrew mind, water was the abyss, the domain and realm of the kingdom of darkness. And the fact that Jesus could walk on water was a tangible example, an object lesson, that by his power we can walk above the kingdom of darkness. And we can keep from sinking into that pit. Do I hear an amen? amen? It's a profound spiritual object lesson. But Jesus wanted the disciples to know that not only he as a man dependent upon the Father could walk on water, but we as sinful men dependent upon him can walk on water. Amen. Are you with me? That's why when Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you, Jesus said what? Come. Listen, the, the story is recorded in Matthew 14, 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately, I like that, immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So far, so good. What is he doing? He's aphoraoing. He's turning his eyes away from everything else, and he's getting them fixed on Jesus. But then what happens? Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me! And immediately, there's our word again. I love it. Immediately. Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? All my friends, please understand the profound spiritual object lesson here and learn from it and apply it to your own personal experience. Please. 
Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did he doubt? He took his eyes off of Jesus. You see, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our what? Faith. And how do we get faith? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? As we look to him, he initiates our faith. As we keep looking to him, he what? He matures, he develops, he strengthens, he perfects, he finishes it. But the moment we take our eyes off of Jesus, what happens? We begin to doubt. We lose faith. And when we lose faith, what happens? What happens? Inevitably. The law of gravity takes over. Now, please understand the spiritual equivalence here. Please understand the spiritual equivalence. The law of gravity is our natural bent towards evil. Did you catch that? What is the law of gravity? It's our natural bent towards evil. Our natural propensity to sink down into the cesspool of carnal thoughts and feelings. At least, if not words and actions. Are you following this? That is gravity. Now, my dear friends, the only way that you and I can overcome gravity, overcome that natural bent towards evil, is by keeping in constant communion with him who alone has power to enable us to do it. Amen. Without him, we can do nothing. nothing. But with him, we can walk on water. Amen. Do I hear an amen? amen? With him, we can keep above that seething cesspool of carnal thoughts and feelings. You can do it even in the privacy of your mind, your thought life. But you can do it only if you keep your mind's eye what? Fixed on Jesus. The moment you break communion with Jesus Christ, come on now, admit it, the moment you break communion with Jesus Christ, what happens? You sink. You sink. And the devil knows this. That's why he is constantly trying to divert the mind's eye from Jesus Christ. He knows that nobody can walk on water. Nobody has the power within themselves to overcome gravity. And they can only do so as they depend constantly on Jesus. And so what is he constantly trying to do? Satan, what is he constantly trying to do? Break our connection with Jesus. You know that. And the moment Peter started looking at circumstances, the wind and the waves, and by the way, inspiration tells us <laughs> that he looked over his shoulder to see whether the disciples were appreciating what he was doing. A little pride involved there. And by the way, my friends, when we learn to walk on water, it's very, very easy to start taking personal credit and get self-righteous and proud. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Please know that every instant you're able to overcome gravity, it's only because of him and not you. Do I hear an amen? amen. You can take no credit for it. Amen. Don't be looking over your shoulders to see if anyone's appreciating what you're doing. Amen. It's only Jesus that makes it possible. Only Jesus that makes it possible. Keep that constant communion and you will have continual access to divine power, and you can defy the law of gravity. Amen. You can defy your natural bent towards evil. Praise God. Amen? You can walk on water. You can. Believe Him. Look to Him. Trust Him. And in His power, keep consistently from sinking down into that cesspool of carnal thoughts and feelings. And by the way, if you for a moment take your eyes off of Jesus and discover you're sinking, at least have the presence of mind that Peter did to cry out, Lord, save me. Amen. And praise God, immediately you'll have a strong hand to pull you out of that cesspool. But what have you done? Come on, what have you done? You've defiled yourself. You have defiled yourself. You have polluted your mind. But praise God, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse, Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. But my dear friends, let's learn from our mistakes, okay? Let's learn from our mistakes. 
Whenever we stumble and fall because of want of watchfulness and prayer, let's sit down and ask God to help us learn from the mistake so that we can avoid doing it over again. And you know, whenever I do that, inevitably, do you know what the reason is that I have sunk? It's because for some reason or another, I took my mind's eye off of Jesus. I let something divert my mind's eye from Jesus. Our chief danger is in having the mind diverted from Christ. That's it. Please, my dear friends, recognize that if you are going to gain consistent victory then, you must discipline your mind's eye to be constantly on Jesus. Are you all with me on this? That's essential. That's essential. The moment you break communion with Jesus, gravity will take over and you will sink. You can't keep above the seething cesspool of your carnal thoughts and feelings without divine power any more than Peter could walk on the surface of the Sea of Galilee without divine power. Direct parallel. Direct parallel. Please know that. Review and Herald, July 11, 1907. So long as you look to Christ, so long as you what? Look to Christ, you are safe. But the moment, the what? The moment you trust in yourself, you are in great peril. He who is in harmony with God will continually depend upon him for help. Amen? Amen. This is the secret, my dear friends, to continual, consistent victory. It's continual, total dependence upon Jesus Christ. It's the secret. Listen to the way David puts it in Psalm 25, verse 15. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. My eyes are what? Ever toward the Lord. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Signs of the Times, September 19, 1900. We need constant communion. We need what? Brothers, sisters, constant communion with Jesus, just as much as we need daily food to nourish the body. If there is a moment when we are in no danger of being deceived by the enemy, then for that moment we may dispense with divine aid. But is there ever a moment when we are not in danger of being deceived by the enemy? Is there ever? No, there isn't. And by the way, who is the enemy that we need to most fear that is always prepared to deceive us? Who is it? It's not Satan. It's self. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Do I hear an amen? Your worst enemy, the one you need to fear the most, is the one that resides within the camp. And by the way, when you get victory over him, you get victory over his ally as well. That's why those of us who overcome the flesh with all of its lusts, its deceitful lusts, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.25, are more than conquerors. Because we not only conquer the flesh, we conquer the kingdom of darkness in the process. Praise God. Praise God. Psalm 16, verse 8. Here's David's secret of victory. I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord how much of the time, my friends? Always. always. Are you hearing a consistent, reoccurring theme here? We're talking about constant, continual communion with Jesus. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved, invincible to the attacks of sin, self, and Satan. Why? Because he sets the Lord always before him. Do you want to be invincible? Come on, I need a little more response than that. Do you want to be invincible to the attacks of sin, self, and Satan? Yes. Then you too must learn to set the Lord always before you. And by the way, when did David get into trouble? when he took his eyes off of the Lord and got them onto Bathsheba. And how fast did he sink when he did that, folks? And David was a man after God's own heart. He was a godly man. 
Please don't ever underestimate how fast and how deep you can sink if you take your eyes off Jesus. This Day with God, page 232. Take God with you in every place. The door is open for every son and daughter of God. The Lord is not far from the soul who seeks Him. The reason why, listen, the reason why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is because they do not set the Lord ever before them. It is in the places where God is least thought of that we need to carry the lamp of life. If God be left out of sight, if our faith and our communion with God are broken, the soul is in positive danger. Integrity will not be maintained. Did you hear that? Does she say integrity might not be maintained? No, she says integrity what? Will not be maintained. Why? Because gravity is going to pull you down the moment you break connection with the only source that can enable you to defy the law of gravity. You break communion with Jesus Christ and your bent towards evil will take over. Integrity will not be maintained. Please understand this. If God be left out of sight, if our faith and our communion with God are broken, integrity will not be maintained. Got to drive that point home. So what do we need to do, my dear friends? If we're going to gain consistent victory, we've got to draw near to God. And He will what? Draw near to you. Psalm 69, verse 18. James 4, 8. Draw near to God. I mean... Uh, Psalm 69, verse 18 is, Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. James 4, 8. Draw near to God and He will what? Draw near to you. But how do we draw near to Him? How do we draw near to Him? By choosing not to resist the drawing power of His love. And by choosing to expose ourselves to the revelation of His love. Did you hear what we just said? That's very important. How do we draw near to God? By choosing not to resist the drawing power of His love, but rather choosing to behold the revelation of that love. Jeremiah 31.3 The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have what? Wrong drawn you. What is it that draws us to God? It's His what? It's His loving kindness. But we must choose to behold the revelation of that if it's going to have a drawing power on us. If you don't behold it, it can't draw you. Are you following me? And where is the drawing power of God's loving kindness ultimately revealed? In Christ and Him crucified. Amen? This is why Jesus says in John 12, verse 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will what? Will draw all peoples to myself. Where is the loving kindness most perfectly and fully revealed? It's in the infinite sacrifice of God to save us, which he made on the cross. And as we behold that, that draws us. If we don't resist it, it will draw us. And as we not only behold the Lamb, but continually behold the Lamb. As we stay with our mind's eye riveted on Christ, we will be continually granted supernatural power to overcome. Amen. Psalm 26, verse 3. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. You keep, your love, you keep your eyes on the loving kindness of God as revealed in Christ and Him crucified, and you can walk on water. Do I hear an amen? amen? You can walk on water. That I may know Him. That I may know Him. Page 250. The soul that loves God loves to draw strength from Him by constant communion with Him. When it becomes the habit of the soul to converse with God, the power of the evil one is broken. Do I hear an amen? amen? For Satan cannot abide near the soul that draws nigh unto God. If Christ 
is your companion. You will not cherish vain and impure thoughts. You will not indulge in trifling words that will grieve him who has come to be the sanctifier of your soul. Those who are sanctified through the truth are living recommendations of its power and representatives of their risen Lord. The religion of Christ will refine the taste, sanctify the judgment, elevate, purify, and ennoble the soul, making the Christian more and more fit for the society of the heavenly angels. Did you hear that last paragraph? Beholding him constantly makes us what? Effective witnesses for the king and fit citizens for the kingdom. My dear friends, behold the Lamb, and you will gain victory. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that we can walk on water if we will keep our mind's eye fixed on Jesus. In his name we praise you. Amen. Thank you, my friends.